Anyone who pays attention to the news or spends any time on social media has to acknowledge that there has been a rise in anti-white racism and a rise in attacks on the very ideals of Western civilisation. Well, obviously no one wants to see people dying at sea. We seem to be all shut off from one another. The only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination. The problem with this legislation is nobody's going to be happy with it. Misogyny, sexism. It is a complete... Fabricated. What we're doing here is pushing the problem uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Who is looking forward to this series? Who's a little nervous? That makes two of us. I think they say you shouldn't talk about religion and politics. For the next 12 weeks, we're going to be doing both. So it's great to have you guys here. Today, my hope uh, is to give us something of a cultural landscape. Uh, it's going to feel a little different. We're not unpacking any particular passage in the Bible, but instead it's my desire to to prepare the runway with a bit of a cultural and biblical foundation. And as I was thinking about today, I was, I was taken back uh, to a key moment in 2017. Now, 2017, it's a big year uh, for our world. Uh, it is, of course, the year that we were introduced to a BBC journalist uh, who was doing a live cross about Korean politics when his two toddlers stormed on in and a desperate uh, wife tried to save the day. Funniest thing the BBC has ever produced. Uh, 2017 was also the year that Warren Beatty announced uh, the Oscar for Best Film to La La Land, only to realise he'd been handed the wrong envelope and the winner was, in fact, Moonlight. Uh, speaking of mix-ups... Uh, 2017 was the year that took many people by surprise as Donald Trump was inaugurated into the White House. Uh, of course, Trump had his many critics. Uh, people were fearful, weren't they, of him inciting violence and there was no shortage of social commentary. Uh, drawing comparison between his bullish leadership and that of Nazi Germany. But in defense, Frankie Boyle pointed out that Trump is nothing like Hitler. There's no way Trump could write a book. Here in Australia, the Richmond Football Club won the flag for the first time, I think, in 35 years. Pauline Hansen made headlines again for wearing a burqa in Parliament. And 2017 was also the year that the Bible Society celebrated its 200th anniversary. Now, to celebrate, the Bible Society partnered up with Cooper's Brewery. Uh, Cooper's is a family-owned business in South Australia, uh, and they offered to produce 10,000 beer cans with Bible verses printed on them, right? As someone who planted a church in a pub, who apparently did uh, communion on tap, uh, I was very into this, thought it was sounding kind of cool, but then things took a surprising turn. The Bible Society decides to double down on its partnership with Coopers, coming up with a brilliant idea to put together a series of political videos to talk about heavy, complex topics and show that we can keep it light. Uh, how many of you guys remember this? Right, so here's uh, in the middle there a rep from the Bible Society. On the right, you have Andrew Hasty. On the left, uh, you have uh, Tim Wilson, uh, both of which are from the Liberal Party. And they're keeping it light while discussing uh, views on marriage equality ahead of the plebiscite that same year. Andrew on the right, uh, holding a more conservative view on marriage equality. Uh, Tim on the left, a gay man himself, advocating for marriage reform. Now, when you see three middle-aged white men in a cross promotion with Cooper's Beer, the Liberal Party and the Bible Society discussing marriage equality, you might say to yourself, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, in a few short hours, all hell broke, broke loose with this boycotting campaign that hit social media. 
uh, they were accusing Coopers of homophobia, uh, and just stream after stream of boycott came through. This was followed by a long list of pubs across the east coast of Australia declaring that they were no longer going to be serving Cooper's beer and news reporters with everyday Aussies who were now pouring out their Cooper's beer saying they would never drink it again. You know that saying, all publicity is good publicity? Not so when you work for Cooper's. They were backpedaling fast, releasing not one but two press releases trying to distance themselves from the Bible Society. The boycott continues, and so the CEO of Cooper's uh, not only cancelled the video from their website and pulled it down, uh, but released their own video, the, the CEO of Cooper's, along with the finance director, staring down the barrel, reading this crafted script in what looks like a terrorist ransom video. <laughs> they apologise for their association with the Bible Society, They cancel the 10,000 beer cans and the icing on the cake. They want to affirm their full support for marriage equality in the LGBTIQ community. Now, what are we to make of this cultural moment? A few observations. First, We need to concede that when it comes to engaging culture with the big issues, particularly where politics and sexuality are involved, Christians can be a little tone deaf, right? I am sure the Bible Society intended well, right? I'm sure they intended well, but this clip reveals that they hadn't quite read the room, right? Stacking the table with liberal MPs in suits, doing a cross-promotion with beer and the Bible. It's just, it's just a little awkward, if not desperate, right? And that reveals something about the Bible society, but I think Christians in general. When it comes to engaging the big issues, sometimes we don't quite read the room. But second... The uproar over the clip made it absolutely clear that every organization in Australia was now on notice. If your business failed to wave the flag and get behind marriage equality, you could and would be cancelled. Now that was true, as you know, of companies like Cooper's, but also of individual employees who were called to toe the party line. Uh, If if you worked for Qantas, if you were an AFL footballer, if you were a teacher in the public education sector, you didn't just need to understand and even respect the views of others, you needed to wave the flag and wear the badge. Third, the Coopers moment signaled that any attempt to have a civil conversation about the big issues of our day are not only complex, but are likely to be shut down. They're likely to be shut down. And I don't think any one of us knows where this really all ends. Was the Cooper's backlash just a case of bad marketing, uh, a PR disaster, or is it a sign of things to come? So as we think about the cultural and political landscape, How do we respond? Well, over the decade, the last decade, Christians in Australia and across the world have responded in a number of ways. Some Christians have chosen now to withdraw. Some Christians have chosen to withdraw. So this is the Christian who sees the scrutiny uh, in the public square and decides to retreat. They don't want to have any part of the conversation. They don't want to talk politics. They don't want to be part of the discussion. In their eyes, the world is now a sinking ship. It's time to jump overboard and swim to shore. Another response we see is that Christians who don't withdraw from politics, but the Christian who worships politics. So this is the Christian who's convinced that if we are going to stop the wave of secularism in our country today, we need to rise up, we need to vote for Christian leaders and see God's law, God's word have its way in society. Third, 
It's important to say that the cultural shift over the last five years in particular have led many Christians into a sea of worldliness. Uh, In the past few weeks, many of you have seen the data from the census showing that uh, people attending church and religious affiliation has dropped. But we need to go a little bit deeper there and recognize that it's not just that people are distancing themselves from the church, but the views within the church are starting to change. Um, For example, uh, there was a Pew study uh, looking at what Christians believe about same-sex marriage. And I'm using that example again because we're not actually exploring that particular issue in this series. But here's what we discover. In 2007, when we planted this church, less than 10% of all church-going Christians supported same-sex marriage. 90% of people going to church said, no, 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 marriage between one man, one woman, that's it, right? By the time we celebrated our 10th anniversary as a church, 37% of people going to church were supportive of same-sex marriage. The number even higher if you're in the younger generation, which was almost 50%. So you ask yourself, well, what has changed? (laughs) The Bible? Has the Bible changed? No, of course, culture has changed. And more and more, we're seeing Christians looking towards culture for their world view. And fourth, and perhaps, perhaps most notable of all, is not the response of uh, withdrawal, worship, or worldliness. It's the response of war. Our culture is not only increasingly political, but incredibly divided. Uh, This is where uh, COVID was fuel to the fire, right? Politics was moving along and and quite hostile. You had the inauguration of Trump. You had race riots in, in in the globe. Then all of a sudden, COVID landed in the midst of that. We lost control. We didn't know where we were going. We were afraid, we were scared, and for many people, we didn't know what to do with that angst. Uh, And that showed itself not only on our social media and and, and on our streets, but it also seeped into the church. I remember uh, heading to the medical clinic at, uh, I think it must have been earlier last year, with Ness to get our first vax. Uh, Not the most romantic date we've ever had. Um, But I decided to capture the moment on Instagram. At the time, at the time, conversations about vaccines hadn't really come into full swing. And I can just tell you, I was not intending to make a political statement, right? But within seconds of it going up online, my inbox was just lit up with a whole bunch of commentary. Uh, Some people like, yeah, thank you for cheering on the cause. We need more of this. Uh, other people who called me a complete sellout. Uh, you're leading the church into destruction. Uh, now that you've had the vaccine, your DNA has changed. You're no longer part of God's creation. You're no longer going to heaven. Uh, someone within our church, a lady and family, uh, been coming to the church for a long time, says we love the church, love the teaching. Seeing that, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back. Uh, and, and you need to appreciate that that, that kind of response and happening all around the world right now. Uh, people used to view their politics through the lens of the Bible. In our day, people look at the Bible and choose their church through the lens of politics. So, how am I feeling about this series? <laughs> I do approach this series with a sense of trepidation. Uh, There's a big, complex topics, important topics we're looking at. And there are a bunch of landmines that I'm sure I'm going to step on a few (laughs) along the way. Uh, But I want you to know that I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm very much looking forward to this series because it's an opportunity, isn't it? To, to get out of the echo chamber, to learn new things, uh, Lord willing, hopefully work out how can we have conversations about big issues in respectful, loving ways, 
And of course, the reason I'm most excited about this series is because it gives us an opportunity to set our eyes on Jesus. Amidst the cultural and political climate that we find ourselves in, marked by so much angst and division, I'm convinced that in Jesus there is a much, much better way. In Jesus there is a much better way. Next week, we dive into the 10 top issues as voted by you, uh, beginning with transgender rights, so very important for us all. Encourage you to be there for that. Uh, bring your work colleagues, bring your friends as we seek to grapple with what is a very significant question. But first, today, I, I want to lay out for you uh, four principles for this series ahead. Uh, my hope is that these will help us navigate the series, but give you a little bit of a sense of our hope and our vision. All right, so for those of you taking notes, here's the first one. For me, um, number one, it's important we understand the left and the right and why we may need both. It's important we understand the left and the right and why we may need both. So many of you may know that the story of left and right actually originates in France in the summer of 1789. Uh, the French Revolution uh, is, is in full motion amidst a massive cultural divide. Three estates, clergy, nobility at the top, the commoners, which make up the majority of the people, are, are paying the majority of the taxes, while the nobility are enjoying their life of opulence. The peasants are starving. Uh, this, this is the background, of course, for uh, Marie Antoinette's famous quote when people come to her and say, oh, the peasants are starving. They have no bread. What does she say? Let them eat cake. Let them eat cake. Right? So there's this cultural divide. Uh, eventually, the people, what do they do? They storm the Bastille and a national assembly is formed which acts as the revolutionary government. And... Of course, much of the debate at this time centers around the power of uh, the king, Louis XVI. And, and, and in the assembly, there's this big vote to determine how much power he should have. And, and, and those who think he should have absolute veto are told to sit on the right side of the assembly. And those who think he should only have partial veto, which was the radical view of the time, were asked to sit on the left. It wasn't anything symbolic. It was just to help them count up the numbers. But of course, because there was so much hostility in the air, people decided to stay on their side and congregate with their tribe. And thus, out of France was birthed the left and the right. Uh, out of this moment, uh, you, you have those uh, advocating for change and those who want tradition Liberalism versus conservatism. Now, if we were to trace this language through history and different nations, it's incredibly uh, complex uh, to do that. Uh, and at times, it's, it's important to say that the, the terms left and right, they are overly simplistic and even at times unhelpful. But when we're talking about the left and the right, we're talking about a distinction here between progressivism and conservatism. Uh, when it comes to issues of shaping our world, uh, progressives, they're going to want to push for change. Right? They're going to push for change. They're going to want to start a revolution. Conservatives, they value tradition and keeping things the way they are. Uh, values for those who are on the left, uh, equality, uh, fairness, uh, internationalism, uh, collectivism, uh, high taxes for those who are wealthy so we can distribute the wealth to the poor, emphasis on public housing, public education, public health care. Uh, and of course, the left is associated with progressive issues like climate change and gender identity, and they want change in these areas. In our context, the Labour Party would be considered centre-left. Uh, if you wanted to go further left, uh, you'd probably be in the Greens Party, uh, if you want to go right to the far left, you're going to be at the Communist Party of Australia, which wants to turn the whole system upside down. On the flip side, the right side of politics has historically been about keeping the government out of people's lives. Uh, right wing is usually associated with conservative views, 
when it comes to sexuality or gender roles. And they see a bigger role for uh, religion and tradition in people's behavior. They value the, the freedom of each individual and want to reduce taxes and reduce red tape for big companies. In our context, the Australian context, the Liberal Party would be associated with centre-right. Uh, if we would go to far-right, we'd be at the Australian First Party. If we want to go even further right, we'd be at Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, who opposed vaccine mandates, advocates for Australia's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement on climate change. They are pro-life, pro-guns, and for the Canadians among us, pro-cannabis. Now, I hope you can realise that when we talk about left and right, very few, if any, fit squarely into one category. For example, you might have somebody who migrates to Australia who is very uh, passionate about race relations, right? Which would lean them a little bit more on the left side of things. But they might also have very traditional views when it comes to gender roles, which would place them a little bit on the right. Uh, similarly, you might have uh, someone who uh, doesn't like governments playing a big role in our life, particularly when it comes to, say, freedom of religion, uh, which would position you more on the right, and yet they may despise aggressive nationalism, which positions them on the left. Uh, in addition, it's important to acknowledge that there are, underneath all of these policies, moral ideals on each side of the, uh, the, the political spectrum, uh, many of which that are helpful and that we need to actually hold together. For example, uh, psychologist uh, Jonathan Haidt points out the helpfulness of progressives who tend to challenge traditional authority because when pushed to the extreme, traditional authority can be quite restrictive and even repressive, particularly for those who are at the bottom end. By contrast, traditionalists value history and order. They don't want to see the society spiral into a sea of constant chains and chaos and confusion. It's not that they're against uh, fairness and justice. They just believe that a healthier society is established with order. Uh, an order that can very easily be taken away. All of which to say there are helpful ideals here that underpin the political spectrum. And we need to work hard through this series to understand what those ideals are and actually to engage them. So that's the first point. This leads to the second point. Very important that we know that the topics we're going to be discussing are politically charged but also incredibly personal. Politically charged, but incredibly personal. I want us to get into all the, the debates and discuss legislation on the left and on the right. That's going to be helpful for us. But these aren't just political issues. They aren't just cultural issues. They are issues about real people. Right, transgender rights, which we'll get to next week, isn't just a debate about pronouns and gender-inclusive bathrooms. It's personal. It's a topic for um, the mother and father trying to raise their teenagers in an environment where identity is now a social construct. Uh, it's a topic impacting the young teenage girl trying to work out her identity, feeling lost and afraid in her own body. Transgender rights is about the, the guy um, looking into his retirement, realizing that he's lived his entire life in what feels like a lie. Um, in preparation for this series, um, I've read and researched extensively, as you would expect. Uh, but what I have found so very helpful is listening to real people who have their own lived experience. And so my hope throughout this series is that we'd each take time to listen and learn from one another. To not stand at a distance shooting down our opponents with our best arguments 
but instead take a posture of humility that seeks to enter in and understand. When I look at Jesus, um, I see one of incredible authority and power. But it never came from a distance. Um, Jesus didn't speak from above. In John's Gospel, it says he is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Jesus met with the woman at the well. Jesus had lunch in the house of a tax collector. Uh, Jesus is there engaging with the political leaders of his day and welcoming the prostitute. Let me encourage you to enter in. Let me encourage you to ask good questions and listen well. That is not to say that you can't express your opinion or what you think is right, right? City on a Hill, we are a Bible-believing church. We believe in truth. We believe in God's word, but we must reclaim the lost art of speaking the truth in love. I would love us to be a church marked by Christ-like conviction and Christ-like compassion. And here's something important to add here. As you get to know those around you, I'm hoping you'll get greater clarity on yourself. We need to be honest with ourselves and ask not only what we believe about a particular issue, but why we believe what we believe. As I hope you know, the the world we are now swimming in is not neutral to what you think and what you feel, and what you believe. Every day, whether you're walking through Burke Street Mall, scrolling Netflix, reading The Economist, uh, there are a million and one voices vying for your mind and your heart and indeed your life. As I've said before, the question is not, am I being discipled, but who or what is discipling me? So everyone has a right to an opinion, but not every opinion is right. And so I'm hoping that as a church, as we journey through this, we would face into our own thinking. Uh, We'd engage our hearts. We'd pray to seek out the truth. This leads to the third observation. Left and right is an opportunity to acknowledge the great contribution of the Christian faith while also repenting of our own failings and sin. Uh, Billy Graham is a great hero of mine and many others, of course, um, regarded as one of the greatest evangelists uh, our world, our generation has ever seen. And yet it's important to acknowledge that Graham grew up in uh, America's South that was strictly divided Uh, by race and injustice that caused harm to so many, many people. And and there's so much commentary on, on Graham's response to this. Some people commend Graham because when he was preaching in the South, he he wouldn't allow segregation. And they acknowledge that. But there's a huge sweep of commentary that says that actually when it came to the civil rights movement, he was a coward. Uh Some say that his nods to racial tolerance uh, were token at best. Uh, He chose not to march with Christian leaders and refused to confront issues head on. And he actually criticized activists saying that we shouldn't be focused on changing laws because our work is a matter of the heart. One of the greatest letters ever written uh, was from Martin Luther King from Birmingham Prison. I encourage you to read it in full. Um, His letter is written to the church and to evangelists like Billy Graham. Listen to what he says. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I've been gravely disappointed with with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the, uh, 
to the positive peace, peace, which is the greatness of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And then he adds, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Throughout this series, as we consider our past and indeed our present, we, in God's grace, will be comforted and there will be times where we are confronted. Um, There is much the Christian church can give thanks for. So many great moments of courage and sacrifice and light and love. But can we accept good without also acknowledging our evil? Can we pat ourselves on the back while also being blind to our own evil and silence? One of my observations about this political age is acknowledging that the church has become incredibly good at calling out the twig in the eyes of the world while not seeing the log that is in our eyes. Uh, When Disney, for example, uh, announced they were looking to include gender non-conforming characters, the church was in arms. Rallies were held at the front of Disney with posters and boards and people screaming. And yet as commentators have pointed out, this is the same church that has been silent about our own financial corruption and misuse of power. These are the churches that stood in silence through decades of abuse. And here they are, up in arms because of a diversity policy at Disney. In the words of Jordan Peterson, if you can't clean up your own room, who the hell are you to give advice to the world? You want to know what's fascinating about Jesus? He opposed evil and was never afraid to call out sin. But you are going to find it, you're going to be hard pressed to find him railing against the world. He flips the table on the religious folk folk who had turned the temple into a den of robbers. He called out the Pharisees for their religious hypocrisy. He challenged the scribes for the distortion of the law. But what do you see when it comes to his engagement with the woman caught in adultery? What do you see when he's talking with the tax collector and the drunk? How do you see Jesus when he views the prodigal son who was lost in a sea of sin and mess? In Jesus, you encounter the friend of sinners. As Jesus himself said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. And so if you've come to this series expecting 12 weeks of grandstanding, 12 weeks of us railing against the world, I have to say you're going to be bitterly disappointed. Now, are there things in our surrounding culture that are at odds with God's good design? Absolutely. But it's my desire, and I believe duty, to first take out the log in my own eye. As the Apostle Paul said, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? Fourth and final point. Don't go left. Don't go right. Go deeper. There's this incredible moment in the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus is followed by a huge crowd. Some say like 10,000 people. 
They've heard about his miracles. They've got glimpses of his teaching and they're out there, families, people, they're, they're all there and they're following him. They're following him for so long that they get hungry. They get thirsty. And so what happens? A little boy comes to Jesus with his lunchbox. What does Jesus do? Jesus transforms the fish and the bread and makes this abundant feast to feed the crowd. And many people, of course, have looked at this and thought, wow, see the compassion of Jesus. He cares for us all. He wants to meet our physical needs. He's, he's marked by compassion, and that's certainly true. But then something remarkable happens. After the bread is broken, Jesus looks out on the crowd and he begins to teach. Uh, and as Jesus is teaching, he works incredibly hard to help the crowd realize that their hunger, their true hunger, is not actually food. Their true hunger is not water or bread. No, our ultimate hunger is not physical, but eternal and indeed spiritual. Now, we need to appreciate that when we're talking about 10,000 people that Jesus is talking to, that they're living at the height of the Roman Empire. And so among the crowd, you have loyalists, people who will take the hill to support Rome, and you have people in the crowd who want to take Rome down by force. Uh, you have some people uh, who would have leaned left politically and others who would have leaned right. Uh, you have some in the crowd who would see themselves as very religious, worshipping God or, in fact, many gods. And you would have people in the crowd who didn't worship any gods. You would have had introverts and extroverts, men and women, young and old. You would have had people who are heterosexual and many, perhaps, who are practicing homosexual. You'd have people who led very wild lives and you would have had accountants. It's a very diverse, large crowd. And yet, despite the political, social, religious difference, what I love about Jesus is his ability to cut through all of that and identify what is common to us all. That under all of our longings, under all of our searchings, is a deep hunger for meaning. A great thirst for significance and hope. In the ancient book of Ecclesiastes, the writer says that God has placed eternity on the hearts of us all. In other words, every day that we wake, we are awaking with an eternal longing. We, we long for eternal meaning. Right? doesn't matter where you land on the political spectrum. We all arise each day looking for lasting significance. Right? Lasting truth. Lasting purpose. Lasting love. We arise every day seeking these things. And this is why culturally we can throw ourselves so deeply into relationships. It's why we can throw ourselves so deeply into our careers. It's why so many people throw themselves so deeply into their politics. Because underneath all of this is a great desire, a great thirst for meaning, significance and hope. Which is why what Jesus says next is so very important for us all. Amidst all of our searching, amidst all of our hunger, Jesus looks out the crowd and he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus didn't come to start a political party. Jesus didn't come to raise up an army to take down Rome. Jesus didn't even come to start a new religion. Jesus came to give you and me what we so desperately need. Jesus came to give us himself. I am the bread of life. I was talking with um, Tim Costello uh, in preparation for this series and uh, many of you know Tim served as the CEO of World Vision, uh, 
Prior to that, he served as a, as a lawyer, uh, serving the marginalized in St. Kilda. He's often there at the forefront of some of the bigger issues facing our world today. And he had some great advice uh, when it came to politics. He said this, he says, don't go left, don't go right, go deeper and go deeper into Jesus. He says, those on the left will pick out all the Bible verses about justice. Those on the right We'll pick out all the Bible verses about personal morality, family, and marriage. Actually, the Bible speaks to both. It doesn't go either left or right. It goes deeper. And that's what I call people to do. So I want to be completely honest about the intentions of this series. City on a Hill, we're not here to start a political party. That's not the agenda. Uh, I actually have little desire to tell you who you should vote for or even which of those 10 issues are the most important. But I am here to help you see the truth of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, and the relevance of Jesus for your life. You don't have labor written on your heart. You don't have liberal written on your heart. You have the name that is above every name written on your heart, and that is the name of Jesus. Do I want, do I want to play an active role in society? Absolutely. Do I believe Christians should think about these issues and act accordingly? Absolutely. Christianity is not just a thinking, it's a being and a doing. So we don't just exist in this world. Some of us need to rise up and recognize the profound opportunities before you and the gifts that God has given you and to do something with your life and see change. Yes, yes, and amen to that. But if that's not grounded in the meaning and the purpose and the eternality of Christ, it all counts for nothing. So don't go left, don't go right, go deeper. As the band comes up, um, here's how I feel we should respond. To start this series, I feel we should share communion together. Um, The Bible tells us the night Jesus was betrayed, what did he do? He took bread and he broke it. And he said, Eat this in remembrance of me, right? I am the bread of life. And he broke that bread. And when Jesus went to the cross, his body was broken. And then he took a cup of wine and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. And my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus, there's forgiveness. For the sins on the left, there is forgiveness. For the sins on the right, there is forgiveness. There is freedom and forgiveness at the cross of Christ. There is life in his name. And so we're going to celebrate that meal to remember and give thanks for him. And so whether you come down on the left or you come down on the right, choose your side. Remember, we're coming as one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Give us eyes to see, hearts to respond. Center us now on the love we have in Jesus, that we'd be a city on a hill shining his light. Prepare our hearts now. Help us to confess our sins, Lord, knowing that your grace is sufficient. Help us to eat this meal in thanks, knowing that Jesus has reconciled all things unto himself. To his glory we pray. Amen.